Welcome to the Plenteous Redemption Podcast, where the cross and the culture are on a collision course for discussion. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require signs, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks foolishness, but under them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, here's your host, Thomas Irvin. Welcome back to the Plenteous Redemption Podcast. We are going to dive right into another study from the book of Haggai. And uh, this book's moving right along. It's going going quickly now. Um, we will soon be in chapter two. I hope this has been a help to you. I hope you have enjoyed following along. And I thank you to those of you, again, that, that stay engaged, that communicate with me, that watch these, listen to these, share these, comment on these. Um, they've been a tremendous, tremendous blessing. Now, the study we're about to venture into is <laughs> quite long. So I'm going to do a lot of reading, very little commenting outside of that reading. I'm going to really do my best to limit the commenting. We're really kind of building a narrative here. The, the study covers the remnant of the people. Let me read the passage to you quickly. Haggai chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, and the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, in the four and twentieth day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. So our context still second year of Darius the king, but this idea of the remnant of the people runs all through the word of God. And um, it's an important topic. Now, it's a big topic. It's one that must be it, that that must be subject to proper division. Is if you if you don't rightly divide the word of truth and you don't rightly divide these ideas, it 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 can become very disjointed and problematic in your biblical doctrine and your coherent your ability to to stick to coherent biblical doctrine. And um, uh, so we're going to look at this. I'm going to go through this as fast as I can. I've got 10 pages of notes here, and um, I've tried to limit these to 45 minutes to an hour, and uh, I would like to keep this one the same, which means you're going to have to keep up. <laughs> There's going to be a lot here to read. So twice in our passage, the Lord refers to the remnant of the people. This idea of a remnant holds great importance in the word of God. It is a term that needs to be understood and also must be rightly divided. Its application can be seen when referring to both the nation of Israel as well as the body of Christ. While they infer similar ideas that the reality is only a small number of people will enter the body of Christ and only a small number of Jews will remain faithful to the Lord, one must be clear when using the term. It's used from the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament to the end of the Bible. And each time it's used, it has its place. And, and it's a group of people it's referring to, so you got to be careful to rightly divide that. You don't want to confuse the church and Israel. You might start thinking that you're going to be part of a remnant that goes through the tribulation. That's what we call confusion. 
That means you have not taken the time to rightly divide the word of truth. And so we're going to look at it. We're going to, we're going to stick within the context of its relevance to the book of Haggai. So that means tracing the history of this remnant back, starting in the book of Jeremiah and then coming back up to the book of Haggai. That's, that's the extent of it that we're going to look at today uh, because this could be a much bigger, much bigger study. Now, tracing this idea through the word of God is interesting, instructive, and to some extent (laughs) discouraging. It highlights the fact the mercy of God is rarely received. That's just a fact. People don't want God. In terms of the body of Christ, it informs us that Christ died for the sins of the world, but there are few that will be saved. God did not intend things to be this way. The Lord commanded that all men everywhere repent, but man is not keen on receiving commandments from God. Man's attitude of rebellion is further exacerbated by failure on behalf of the Jewish remnant, as well as on the remnant that belongs in the body of Christ. The Lord said, they have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. An unwillingness to repent is one factor. Having never heard of their need to repent because those with the message fail to deliver it is quite another factor. And that, that's a massive problem that we have today that well, it'd be wonderful if enough people became concerned enough about that to help resolve that problem. Uh, It's one thing for people to reject the truth. It's another thing that the truth was never presented to them because no one was, there was not a remnant who felt it was necessary to take it out into all the world and, and preach it to every creature. While God's remnants are defined by their willingness to cleave to him and cling to his word, somehow there exists a perpetual failure to take that word to the nations. It is wonderful to be counted among this identity. But it is heartbreaking to also be among the slothful who refuse to go labor in the fields white unto harvest. We have failed, but that does not prevent us from being his workmanship. The Lord is faithful. And yet, despite the failure of his remnant, we as a whole are given individual responsibility. As such, we can rise above and be separated from the idle attitudes of the remnant. With this in mind, it is both a blessing and troublesome to be part of God's remnant. While it details the fact of failure by those who trust God, it also details the fact the Lord will not leave us comfortless. Praise the Lord. He's going to pick up our slack. I mean, that's just, that's our God. It's a blessing to know that. But but shouldn't that blessing be motivation to us to press as hard as we can? And and though we're, we're, and though we, we could say at the end of our life, I've run my race, I've given all, I've done everything I can, but I fell short. Well, the Lord, the Lord will take care of that. Uh, instead of at the end of our life saying, yeah, I didn't do anything, but the Lord's still going to pick up my slack. <laughs> uh, both are true, but one is honorable and one is shameful. And we want to hopefully end up on the honorable side of things. He will in the end accomplish his own will, despite our inability or unwillingness to obey his word. As we look at this idea of a remnant, we find some very interesting characteristics, particularly as it relates to Judah. While this study of the remnant can take several forms and spans the entirety of the Bible, I'm going to try and keep this particular study relevant to the book of Haggai and the remnant of the people discussed that relate to Judah in this day. So first, there's a very interesting idea that that appeared when I was studying this and trying to uh, uh, study it within the proper relevance to the book of Haggai. Now in second Kings 17, uh, Israel is taken into captivity that the Northern kingdom, what is unbelievably interesting is that Israel is taken into captivity. And we understand Israel to be the 10 tribes that make up the Northern kingdom. So when we talk about Israel and Judah after the nation of Israel split into two. You have the northern kingdom, which is Israel, composed of 10 tribes. And then you have the southern kingdom, which is Judah, composed of Judah and Benjamin, uh, just two, two southern tribes. When Israel, the northern kingdom, that we presume does not incorporate Judah into that northern kingdom, when they were taken into captivity, 
Israel, the ten northern tribes. A remnant of Judah was left behind in Samaria. That is unbelievably interesting. Now, we're also going to see when Judah, the southern kingdom, was later taken into, into Babylon into captivity, a remnant of Judah was left behind. Just very interesting that when God takes his people out of the land, he seems to leave Judah behind each time. Now, I, I, we don't have time to look at all the ins and outs of that today, but I presume it has something to do with someone uh, who is deemed to be the, the lion of the tribe of Judah coming from that, that tribe and, and that part of the kingdom. So uh, 2 Kings 17, verses 7 through 23, For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods and walked in the statutes of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel and of the kings of Israel, which they had made. And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord, their God. And they built them high places in all their cities from the tower of the watchmen to the fenced city. And they set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burnt incense in all the high places as did the heathen, whom the Lord carried away before them and wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served idols whereof the Lord had said unto them, "Ye shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah. So he incorporates both in his frustration here, but only one's going to be taken into captivity. That's important to note by all the prophets and by all the seers saying, Turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets, notwithstanding, they would not hear, but harden their necks like to the neck of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God. And they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies, which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. And they left the commandments of the Lord, their God and made them molten images, even two calves and made a grove and worshiped all the host of the heaven and served Baal. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and used divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. Now, that's very interesting because we don't understand Judah to be part of the northern kingdom. They're part of the southern kingdom. But he removed Israel from Samaria. But he left behind certain of the tribe of Judah. It's it's just, it's a very interesting note. And uh, maybe in a later study, we'll dive into trying to, trying to see if we can resolve specifically why that is. uh, It's just, it's very interesting. Also, Judah kept not the commandments of the Lord, their God, but walked in the statutes of Israel, which they made. (laughs) That's not good. You don't make up your own statutes. You obey the statutes of the Lord. And the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel and afflicted them and delivered them into the hand of spoilers until he had cast them out of his sight. For he rent Israel from the house of David and they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king and Jeroboam drave Israel from following the Lord and made them sin sin a great sin. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They departed not from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants, the prophets, so was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. Now, Israel, the northern kingdom, they are taken away. God is frustrated with their disobedience. And uh, as we have read many times in Second Chronicles 36, Judah and Israel apparently took God to the point that he felt there was no remedy other than to kick them out of the land. 
And uh, so he took them away. It is very interesting that he left behind a remnant of Judah in Israel or in, in Samaria. In terms of a remnant and preserving the nation of Israel, it's interesting the Lord left Judah behind. Of course, Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah, according to Revelation 22. So um, it really stands out to me that we have these two major uh, historical points of captivity for God's people, and both time he left behind a remnant of Judah. Uh, that, that would seem to be significant. Now, next we have Judah's captivity. That's in Jeremiah 39, verses 1 through 10. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month came Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army against Jerusalem, and they besieged it. And in the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, the ninth day of the month, the city was broken up. And all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate, even Nergal Sherezer, Simgar Nebo, Sarsakam, Rabsaris, Nergal Sherezar, Ram Rabmag, and all the residue of the princes of the king of Babylon. Those are some wonderful names. If anyone is having a baby, I wonder if my wife would like Rabmag. No? Okay. Well, we're, we're having a baby, uh, Lord willing. The baby will be due in April. So I'll, she's been asking me to come up with names. <clears throat> so I, I think I'll have to run some of these names past her and see what she thinks. But with all the residue of the princes of the king of Babylon, and it came to pass that when Zedekiah, the king of Judah, saw them and all the men of war, then they fled and went forth out of the city by night by the way of the king's garden, by the gate betwixt the two walls, and he went out the way of the, of the plain, but the Chaldeans' army pursued after them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had taken him, they brought him to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to Riblah in the land of Hamath, where he gave judgment upon him. The king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah in Riblah before his eyes. Also, the king of Babylon slew all the nobles of Judah. Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with chains to carry him to Babylon. And the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the houses of the people with fire and break down the walls of Jerusalem. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive into Babylon the remnant of the people that remained in the city and those that fell to him with the rest of the people that remained. But Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left the poor of the people, which had nothing in the land of Judah, and gave them vineyards in the fields at the same time. So, so this remnant is taken into captivity into Babylon, but then a remnant is left behind in Judah to maintain the land and to, I presume, take care of the land on behalf of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, I don't know what his, what he thought his future plans were going to be, but God said that land would rest for 70 years. And uh, other than a little bit of Gentile activity in and out and um, the activity of a very small remnant of Judah in Samaria and in Judah, um, it was very quiet. So Nebuchadnezzar entered Jerusalem on behalf of Nebuchadnezzar and he destroyed the city. He burned the temple to the ground. He tore down the walls and he destroyed the homes of Judah's royalty. But he took in the captivity a remnant, and he left behind a remnant of the people. It's very interesting. Again, um, and we're going to see, we're going to read mostly in these next several passages about the remnant that stayed behind. Um, they had a very tumultuous time, uh, some of it by choice and some of it just <laughs> life in a fallen land, it's just how it goes. And uh, um, I don't want to be subject to that, but that's, that's where we are in this world, in a sin-cursed world. So Jeremiah 40, verses 7 through 12. Now, when all the captains of the forces which were in the fields, even they and their men, heard that the king of Babylon had made Gadaliah, the son of Ahikam, governor of the, in the land, and had committed unto him men and women and children and the poor of the land of them that were not carried away captive to Babylon. Then they came to Gedaliah to Mizpah, even Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and Johanan, and Jonathan, the sons of Korea, and Sariah, the son of Tanhumeth, 
and the sons of Ephi and Netophathite, and Jezaniah and the son of Mekathite, they and their men, and Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, swear unto them and to their men, saying, Fear not to serve the, the Chaldeans. Dwell in the land and serve the king of Babylon. Uh, it, should, it shall be well with you. As for me, behold, I will dwell at Mizpah to serve the Chaldeans, which will come unto us, but ye gather, but ye gather ye wine and summer fruits and oil and put them in your vessels and dwell in your cities that ye have taken. Likewise, when all the Jews that were in Moab and among the Ammonites and in Edom and that were in all the countries heard that the king of Babylon had left a remnant of Judah and that he had set over them Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, even all the Jews. Now, I presume this breaks down all the barriers, uh, tribal barriers, kingdom barriers. This is any Jews that were in those countries, when they found out there was a small remnant left behind, they're like, man, let's, let's go join them and, and see what's going on there. And so um, even all the Jews returned to all the places where they were driven and came to the land of Judah uh, to get Eliah unto Mizpah and gathered wine and summer fruits very much. So the Lord is telling us that all these Jews came back and uh, regardless of their respective tribe or, or kingdom, they came back and wanted to take part in what was going on here in Judah. And uh, so now you have this remnant of Jews. So that's everybody. That's that's all remnants of all 12 tribes coming back into the land and joining with this remnant of Judah that is left behind. Now, of course, it would not go well for them. Um, they'd be subject to the cruel tortures of murderous men. And uh, it seems Ishmael and his descendants were murderers even back in those days. And nothing has changed. Descendants of Ishmael are still murderers today. Uh, you'll have to read the rest of Jeremiah 40 to better understand what I'm talking about. We're going to, you'll, um, you know, get the idea as we go through these next several passages. Ishmael was a bloody man. He, he was just, he, he was a, a dirty, bloody man. He still is today. His remnant, his descendants, they're a bunch of murderers. They, they have a murderous religion. And it's, it's amazing. They call it the religion of peace and they go about the world killing people. And, um, you know, there, there's a, there's a worldview that makes those people palatable to you. There are certain worldviews in this world that just perfectly align together with, uh, people who believe in killing people who believe that death is acceptable, whether it's the murder of a child in the womb, or, or, or if it's the murder of an infidel from a, from a religious perspective, uh, they, they're, they're of the same ilk, they have the same background. They might have different standards of living, uh, but they both believe in believe killing, you know, in order to maintain your, your personal religion is perfectly fine. They don't have a problem. Neither one of them has a problem with it. So these men come in, they, they kill Gedaliah, they put him to death and they cause just instability and, and fear for this remnant that's left behind. Uh, Jeremiah 41 verses 13 through 18. Now it came to pass that when all the people which were with Ishmael saw Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces that were with him, they were glad. So all the people that Ishmael had carried away captive from Mizpah cast about and returned and went unto Johanan, the son of Korea. But Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, escaped from Johanan with eight men and went to the Ammonites, then took Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces that were with him, all the remnant of the people whom he had recovered from Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, from Mizpah, after that he had slain Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, even mighty men of war, and the women and the children and the eunuchs, whom he had brought again from Gibeon, and they departed and dwelt in the habitation of Chimham, which is by Bethlehem, to go to go to enter into Egypt because of the Chaldeans, for they were afraid of them because Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah had slain Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, whom the king of Babylon made governor in the land. So this remnant, they're not sure what to do as Ishmael has murdered the man that uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar put in charge of this remnant. And they're afraid there might be retribution from the Babylonians uh, for 
for doing this, and they don't know who, you know, the Babylonians, we just read what they did in Jerusalem. They, they could be ruthless. So they didn't know what to do, where to go. So they're, they're like, maybe we should go hang out next to Egypt and think about going there. Well, Jeremiah 42, verses 1 through 22. Then all the captains of the forces, and Johanan the son of Korea, and Jezaniah the son of Hoshiah, and all the people from the least even unto the greatest came near and said unto Jeremiah the prophet, Let we beseech thee, our supplication be accepted before thee, and pray for us unto the Lord thy God, even for all his remnant, for we are left but a few of, of many. As thine eyes do behold us, that the Lord thy God may show us the way wherein we may walk. And the thing that we may do, then Jeremiah the prophet said unto them, I have heard you, behold, I will pray unto the Lord your God according to your words, and it shall come to pass that whatsoever thing the Lord shall answer you, I will declare it unto you. I will keep nothing back from you. Then said they to Jeremiah, the Lord be a true and faithful witness. Amen. Sounds good, right? Sounds like a modern day fake cowardly Christian. And you may not know what I'm talking about yet if you're not familiar with this passage, but you're about to find out. The Lord be a true and faithful witness between us if we do not even according to all the things for which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us. Whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send thee, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. So it seems like they understand blessing comes from being obedient. They at least know, they understand it enough to at least give verbal assent to it. A lot of lip service, just flapping at the mouth means absolutely nothing. And it came to pass after 10 days that the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah. Then called he Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces which were with him, and all the people uh, from the least to the greatest, and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto whom ye sent me to present your supplication before him. You sent me. Here's what he said. You said you wanted to know what he had to say. Here's what he had to say. I'm going to, tell, I'm going to show you. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to explain it to you. I'm going to break it down. If you will still abide in this land, then I will build you and not pull you down. And I will plant you and not pluck you up. For I repent me of the evil that I have done unto you. Be not afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom ye are afraid. Be not afraid of him, saith the Lord, for I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his hand. I will show mercies unto you that ye may have mercy upon you and cause you to return to your own land. But if ye say, we will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord your God. Now they said at the onset, whatever the Lord says, we're going to obey it. If it's evil or if it's good, we don't care. We, we just, we want to know what God says and that's what we're going to do. Sounds great. It doesn't sound like God is fooled because he points the fact out. If you say you're not going to do it. So we will not dwell on this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord, your God saying no, but we will go into the land of Egypt where we shall see no war nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor have hunger of bread, and there will, there will we dwell. And now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. So this is the American mentality. No, we'll, we'll, we'll elect Donald Trump. We'll get a Republican in there. He'll, he'll save us. We, we'll see no war, or at least we'll see no war on, on our, in our territory, on, on our land, on our soil. We won't go hungry. I know inflation is going through the roof right now. Well, God's telling these people, you think the political system in Egypt is what's going to save you. I'm telling you, if you go into Egypt and disobey my word, I'll tear that entire political system down just to show you that's not where your help is going to come from. Sounds like a bunch of American Christians need to read this book and stop depending upon political systems to save you, to help you, or to strengthen you, or to lift you up, or whatever whatever it is you think they're going to do that God apparently can't do. Or God might, might cause a half-dead senile fool to get 81 million votes and overtake the, the figure of your political salvation and leave us desolate. 
because you can't focus on the word of God and doing the work of God. You got to get, you, you just, you're just bound to, to thus saith Rush Limbaugh, thus saith Sean Hannity, thus saith whatever political commentator you listen to and, and obey <laughs> because we're not obeying the voice of the Lord, the word of the Lord. We're obeying the word of political figures who, who have nothing to do with God they might have a slight conservative bent to them when they're not interviewing and 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 uh, rubbing elbows with homosexuals and transgender people. Then you know, it's maddening. Well, here it is in God's word. Go to Egypt. This is what I'll do to Egypt if you go there. And now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye remnant of Judah. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel: If ye wholly set your faces to enter into Egypt and go to sojourn there. Then it shall come to pass that the sword, which ye feared, shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt, and the famine, whereof you were afraid, shall follow close after you there in Egypt, and there shall ye die. Well, praise the Lord. So shall it be with all the men that set their faces to go into Egypt to sojourn there. They shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, and none of them shall remain or escape from the evil that I will bring upon them. It doesn't matter how powerful America is. You defy God. It didn't matter how powerful Egypt was. God said, I can get you in Egypt just as well as I can get you anywhere else. If you're not going to obey me, if you have no fear of me, you will not obey my word. If you're not let me help you, you will not let me strengthen you. Let me save you. Let me protect you. You're going to run somewhere else. You're not going to seek first the, the, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You're going to seek first the kingdom of Trump and his righteousness. <laughs> well, God will bring it down. Whatever it is you think is protecting you, God will bring it all down. And for thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as mine anger and my fury hath been poured forth upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so shall my fury be poured forth upon you when you shall enter into Egypt and ye shall be an execration and an astonishment and a curse and a reproach, and ye shall see the place no more. The Lord has said concerning you, O ye remnant of Judah, go ye into Egypt, know certainly that I have admonished you this day, for ye dissembled in your hearts when ye sent me unto the Lord your God. God already knew it was fake. He already knew it wasn't real. From the start, from the very beginning, God already had it, he already had these people pegged. For you dissembled in your hearts when you sent me unto the Lord your God, saying, Pray for us unto the Lord our God, and according unto all that the Lord our God shall say, so declare unto us, and we will do it. And now I have this day declared it to you. Here it is. But ye have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God, nor anything for the which he has sent me unto you. Now therefore, know certainly that ye shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, in the place where you desire to go and to sojourn. So you, you think Egypt is your refuge? God is not your refuge? It will not go well. It's not going to happen. So let's see what happens. Jeremiah 43. Jeremiah 43, verses 1 through 7. And it came to pass that when Jeremiah hath made an end of speaking unto all the people, all the words of the Lord their God. That's what they said they wanted, right? Whatever he says, we'll obey it. We need you to go seek the Lord and tell us what the Lord wants us to do. And whatever he says, we'll obey it. Okay. So he gave them all the words of the Lord, their God, for which the Lord, their God had sent him to them. Even all these words then spake Azariah, the son of Hoshiah and Johanan, the son of Korea and all the proud men saying unto Jeremiah, thou speakest falsely. The Lord, our God hath not sent sent thee to say, go not into Egypt to sojourn there. See, they already had in their mind, we want to go to Egypt. Surely if we ask Jeremiah to go get permission from God, he'll come back and say, yeah, go into Egypt. That's a good idea. They just needed, they just wanted or desired God to sign off on what they already wanted to do. They didn't really care what God was going, going to tell them to do. They just assumed that I have this wonderful thought. I want to go to Egypt. That thought was probably from God. <laughs> I mean, it's my thought. Of course, my thoughts must be in line with the Lord. With the Lord, I mean, why wouldn't they be? And then when Jeremiah comes back and does not sign off on on their uh, expectations, 
Here's what they say. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt and sojourn there. But Barak the son of Neriah setteth thee on against us for to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans, that they might put us to death and carry us away captives into Babylon. So Johanan the son of Korea and all the captains of the forces and all the people obeyed not the voice of the Lord to dwell in the land of Judah. But Johanan the son of Korea and all the captains of the forces took all the remnant of Judah that were returned from all nations. Remember, he had this big return, this big rejoining in the land. Well, here we go. Whether they had been driven to dwell in the land of Judah, even men and women and children and the king's daughters and every person of ne that Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had left with Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, and Jeremiah the prophet, and Barak, the son of Neri Neriah. So they came into the land of Egypt, for they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. Thus they came even to Tehapanes. So there they are. It's no different today. Members of the remnant, people who claim to belong to God today, they've got one foot in the world and one foot in the church. They, they listen to a little bit of preaching, but they listen to a whole bunch of political commentary. And they read a little bit of Bible, but then they listen to a, they watch a whole bunch of television. It, it's no different today. God says, you know, love not the world. You better stay away from that stuff. Stop setting your eyes on that. And we say, well, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. No, it's not. It's not okay. And you're going to, you're going to, you're going to play a role in bringing God to a point of, of anger and judgment. And, um, that's a dangerous place to be. The book of Jeremiah should help you develop a healthy fear of God and what he might do to, to those who openly defy him. Because it's much worse when you know what God said to do. These people specifically asked, would you, Jeremiah, would you go ask God what he wants us to do? Oh, by the way, tell him we have plans to go to Egypt. I'm, I'm sure he'll sign off on it. And then Jeremiah comes back and says, no. God said he wants you to stay in the land. God is inviting them. Stay in the land. Let me protect you and I'll build you up. He, he's asking them to take on this, this complicated, complex project of being faithful to the Lord while, while serving him in the land. So you got two, two sets of difficulties. You can run off to the world and and uh, submit yourself to them in the hopes that they will protect you and then watch God tear it down because you're not supposed to be there. Or you can stick with God, do what God said to do, let him bless you, let him help you, let him protect you, let him strengthen you as you go through the difficulties that come with being obedient to God. Either way, it's going to be difficult. Why not pick the difficulty that comes with God's blessing? choice is yours. Jeremiah 44 verses 1 through 16. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews which dwell in the land of Egypt. Here we go. Which dwell at Migdal and at Tehapanes and Noph and in the country of Petro saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Ye have seen all the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem and upon all the cities of Judah. And, be and behold, this day they are a desolation and no man dwelleth therein. So it's not like they didn't have something to compare their disobedience to. What would happen if they were disobedient? It's not like they didn't know. They, they knew very well. They just saw what God did. Um, so because of their wickedness, which they have committed to provoke me to anger, in that they went to burn incense and to serve other gods whom they knew not, neither they, ye nor your fathers. Habiet, I sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, saying, Oh, do not this abominable thing that I hate. But they hearken not, nor incline their ear to turn from their wickedness to burn no incense unto other gods. Wherefore, my fury and mine anger was poured forth and was kindled in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem. And they are wasted and desolate as at this day. Therefore, now thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, wherefore commit ye this great, wherefore commit ye this great evil against your souls to cut off from you man and woman, child and suckling out of Judah to leave you none to remain. 
and that you provoke me unto wrath and the works of your hands, burning incense to other gods in the land of Egypt, whither ye be gone to dwell, that ye might cut yourselves off, did it to yourself, and that ye might be a curse and a reproach among all the nations of the earth. I would say that's, that's still true today. Most, almost every nation on the earth <laughs> hates Israel and want to get rid of those Jews. Have you forgotten the wickedness of your fathers and the wickedness of the kings of Judah and the wickedness of their wives and of your wickedness, of your own wickedness and of the wickedness of your wives, which they have committed in the land of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem? They are not humbled even unto this day. Neither have they feared nor walked in my law nor in my statutes that I set before you and before your fathers. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will set my face against you for evil, and to cut off all Judah, and I will take the remnant of Judah that have set their faces to go into the land of Egypt to sojourn there, and they shall all be consumed and fall in the land of Egypt. They shall even be consumed by the sword and by the famine. They shall die. From the least even unto the greatest, by the sword and by the famine, and they shall be in an execration and an astonishment and a curse and a reproach. For I will punish them that dwell in the land of Egypt, as I have punished Jerusalem by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, so that none of the remnant of Judah, which are gone into the land of Egypt to sojourn there, shall escape or remain, that they should return unto the land of Judah, to the which they have a desire to return to dwell there. For none shall return, but such as shall escape, then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods and all the women that stood by, a great multitude, even all the people that dwell in the land of Egypt, and Pathros answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. Well, <laughs> typically people aren't so bold as to say that. Not, not that directly, but that's, that's where we are today. Oh, God said, don't do this. I don't care. I don't think there's anything wrong with doing it. You know, my family, we do it. God doesn't do anything to us. <laughs> okay. Keep toying with God. Jeremiah 44 verses 20 through 30. And, uh, we'll start rounding this out. I know it's a lot of reading. It's a lot of Bible verses, but it, it, it tells the story for you and it lets you see this trace this remnant uh, up to the book of Haggai. Then Jeremiah said unto all the people, to, all, to, to the men and to the women and to all the people which had given them that answer, saying, The incense that ye burn in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, ye and your fathers, your kings and your princes and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them. And it came not into his mind, so that the Lord could no longer bear because of the evil of your doings and because of the abominations which ye have committed, therefore is your land a desolation and an astonishment and a curse without an inhabitant as at this day. Because ye have burned incense and because ye have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, nor walked in his law, nor in his statutes, nor in his testimonies, therefore this evil is happened unto you as at this day. Moreover, Jeremiah said unto all the people and to all the women, Hear the word of the Lord. Now, it's important to point out the women. As in this portion of judgment, it's a bunch of rebellious women that cause the problems. A bunch of dirty wives who couldn't keep, who, their, their husbands were weak and couldn't keep the home in order and, call, and, and, and provoke that family to trust God. Instead, a bunch of loud, obnoxious women take over and begin worshiping other gods. And that's exactly what happens when you have weak men and a bunch of loud, contentious women. Neither is acceptable to God. You can't be a weak man. You can't be a loud, contentious woman. And I'm sure that'll win a lot of friends and help a lot of people come to love, love me. I, I, I get it. But God expects men to lead the home, and men are expected to lead the, their wives and their children in the way they should go. And when you don't do that, this is what you get. Isaiah said, woe unto that nation when women and children reign over you. Woe unto them. So, sorry, Miss Merkel. 
and whoever else, you know, you know when, when you put women in control, when they, when they usurp authority over men, either in the church or in governmental positions of leadership, you go all through the Bible, it, God expected men to reign, to rule, to lead, not to abuse women. That's not the point. And, and you can't conflate the two. You know, God at no point ever, ever alluded to the idea it was acceptable for a man to abuse a woman in any way. But he did expect men to lead. And when men fail to lead and women take over and pick up that mantle, things go into complete disarray. And that's, that's, that's clear to be seen all over the world. The weakness of women in trying to lead and, and, uh, and deal with the, the harsh difficulties of political life, that's not a place for a woman. But that's, that's my biblical opinion. Moreover, Jeremiah said unto all the people and unto all the women, hear the word of the Lord, all Judah that are in the land of Egypt, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouths. <laughs> careful what you say. And fulfilled with your hand. Careful what you do. Saying, We will surely perform our vows that we have vowed to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. Ye will surely accomplish your vows. <laughs> God said, Yep, you're going to do it. And surely perform your vows. Therefore, hear ye the word of the Lord. All Judah that dwell in the land of Egypt, behold, I have sworn by my great name, saith the Lord, that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt. Whew. Saying, the Lord God liveth. Behold, I will watch over them for evil and not for good. And all the men of Judah that are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by the famine until there be an end of them. Yet a small number that escape the sword shall return out of the land of Egypt into the land of Judah. And all the remnant of Judah that are gone into the land of Egypt to sojourn there shall know whose words shall stand, mine or theirs. And this shall be a sign unto you, saith the Lord, that I will punish you in this place, that ye may know that my words shall surely stand against you for evil. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give Pharaoh Hophra, king of Egypt, into the hand of, of his enemies, and into the hand of them that seek his life, as I gave Zedekiah, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, his enemy, and that sought his life. So there you go. The political system's coming down. You ran to that political system for, for help, for refuge against God. You thought, oh, there's a king. He'll, he'll protect me. God's not going to protect me in my land. But that king, that president, that prime minister, they'll protect me. God said, I'll bring the whole thing down. Just to show you, just to punish you, just to deal with you and deal with your obedience, I'll bring everything down. So, so we're left with a remnant of Judah in Samaria and in Judah. There's a tiny, tiny remnant that escaped and was able to live there. Israel, the northern kingdom, is taken into captivity by Assyria but they were then scattered to various nations. This included their being sent to Babylon. The king of Assyria sent certain of Israel during their captivity in Assyria into Babylon. He sent them to different nations, and Babylon was one of those, which means a remnant of Israel lived in Babylon before Judah was taken into captivity. That's very interesting. So by the time Judah gets there, I, I, I don't know the exact, I don't recall the exact times that I've read. I think the estimation is about 100 years later. Um, uh, but don't quote me on that. Maybe I'll try to see if I can pin that down. But by the time Judah gets there, there are Jews from the Northern kingdom already there, which may, they may have had an influence on, on, you know, th their perception there and their ability to live there. And, uh, it's just very interesting is how God brings it all together. Then Judah is taken into Babylon a remnant remain in the land while a remnant is taken by Nebuchadnezzar into Babylon. Of the remnant in Babylon, only a remnant of the remnant remained faithful to the Lord. Daniel and the three Hebrew boys refused to submit to Babylonian gods or religious rituals. So you had, even amongst this remnant that's taken, only a small portion didn't buy into the Babylonian system. They, they said, no, we're going to remain faithful to God. So Persia takes Babylon and Cyrus makes his decree to send the people back to the promised land. And with that, only a remnant returns. 
are you catching a trend here? <laughs> in every period, only a remnant remains faithful to God. That's true now in the church age. So then you have Ezra, Ezra 9, verses 5 through 15. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God and said, O oh my God, I am ashamed to blush, to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head and our trespasses grown up unto the heavens since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day. And for our iniquities have we, our kings, our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to the spoil, to a confusion of face. As it is this day, and now for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. So uh, Ezra was a great man. Um, Ezra was, he was a ready scribe. He was faithful to God. He's repenting. Uh, you know, I didn't read the entire passage. You can read it there when you have time. He saw the sin of Israel, the sin of Judah, and it broke his heart and he repented for them. Now, Nehemiah was the same. Nehemiah chapter one, verses one through nine, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah, and it came to pass in the month of Chislu in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, Hanani, one of my brethren came, he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear be attentive. So he, he cries out to God for help and um, God grants his petition, but he's broken over the condition of the remnant. And, and that's what I mean. It's, it's a blessing to be a part of the remnant because that, that is that small group of people in the world at any given time that, that is to some extent faithful to God, dependent upon God, or at least has the desire to. Now the remnant can fall away as we saw, you know, that small remnant that was left in the land that took off to Egypt. Um, they can turn their back on God. But portions of the remnant tend to stay faithful. There's, there's often a remnant within the remnant. <laughs> and um, that's, that's what we want to be. Nehemiah thanked God for this opportunity, and he went and he rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem to protect the remnant that had gone back. Zerubbabel came back. He, he left, and he brought a remnant with him. Ezra came, and he brought another remnant with him. Nehemiah came and brought another remnant with him. And, uh, and they just did their, their best to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and, and to create a, a place and an atmosphere where God could be served. And, and it lasted for so long. You know, Haggai and Zechariah got the hearts of the people stirred up. They got moving in the right direction. And then by the time we get to the book of Malachi, it had all fallen apart again. That's what we want to try and prevent but it requires people being faithful. It requires people preaching God's word. It requires people obeying God's word. It requires a healthy fear of the Lord. All these things are required in order to maintain a healthy remnant who's going to serve God. Now, this is, this is the very remnant that Haggai speaks of. But in the book of Haggai, we don't have one man. We don't have Ezra or Nehemiah repenting and trusting God. Instead, we have the leadership of Judah as well as the remnant of all the people. And it surely pleased God. The Lord stirred the spirits of the people and the temple of God was built. We got a lot of work to do here in this world now. Our repentance and obedience to God will cause him to jump in with us, revive our hearts, stir our spirits, work alongside us and help us to get the work done that needs to be accomplished. 
even in odd times with COVID-19 and lockdowns and church closures and all the ridiculous things that are going on, we need God's help. We don't want to turn to the world for refuge. We want to turn to God. And I, I pray that you'll do that and join me as we do so. Thank you for listening and God bless. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. You can learn more about our ministry by visiting www.plenteousredemption.com. You can hear more Plenteous Redemption podcast audio at www.plenteousredemption.media. Please comment below if this podcast has been a help to you. Also, inform us of future topics that would interest you. Thank you again for listening to the Plenteous Redemption podcast.